So my name is Wendy. I'm a nurse practitioner from Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I've been at Vanderbilt taking care of patients like yourself since 2001. Um, we've been a part um, at Vanderbilt of near um, every one of the clinical trials that are going on, trying to find better medicines and better therapies to take care of all of you. And what I was saying is that I, I really am incredibly honored to be asked by the PFF to be one of the few faculty members that gets to address the patients. So um, it has always been my privilege to be able to be a part of your team. Um, if there's ever any questions about what we're presenting, please come forward to Dr. Lee or myself or any of the other faculty members that you're gonna meet um, over the next couple days. We, we are thrilled that you're here um, because you being here shows that you care very much and that you want to learn as much as you can about your disease. And my bet is that you're gonna take all this information home and give it to your providers at home. So um, just to get started, my lecture is to talk about symptom management strategies for your lung disease, um, not side effects of your medicine. So I just want to make that clear. We're talking about symptoms related to your lung disease, and I hear some of those symptoms right now. So keys to managing your symptoms, and we're going to keep coming back to these keys. You know, basically what we're trying to do is palliative care. All right, and people go, oh my gosh, palliative care. You know, palliative care is really taking care of and managing these symptoms to relieve the suffering of the symptoms that you're having. And a lot of times when people think about suffering, they think about pain. But my guarantee is that every one of you in here are suffering. You're suffering from shortness of breath. You're suffering from cough. You're suffering from depression. So even those things are what palliative care is all about. And that's what Dr. Lee's role is, is to help minimize that um, and, and reduce the stress that's caused from suffering from these symptoms. So we're gonna talk about several of these symptoms first, and then I'll um, kind of talk a little bit about how we go about managing those symptoms and how you all have helped us understand how to manage those symptoms. So dyspnea, is also called short of breath or shortness of breath. And it is very different from hypoxemia, which will be the next thing I talk about. Dyspnea is, the prim is what we would consider one of our primary markers for disease progression. So how do we measure that? In clinical trials, we have a lot of different tools that we use and a lot of questionnaires that help us understand maybe how dyspneic you are. But you can never, and that's, those tools are really hard to use in the clinical practice. One thing I wanna to stress to you, don't ever let anybody tell you how dyspneic you are. That is yours to own. Okay, so I've seen people do a six minute walk test and their lips turn blue and their nose is blue and they're panting and I say, how short of breath are you? And they say, I'm not short of breath at all. Okay, that's their perception of their dyspnea. In my head I'm going, good grief, this is, this is a measured as an eight out of 10, but it's your perception of your shortness of breath. Okay, so the likewise is true. If you're not panting at all and your lips and your nose aren't blue and I ask you how short a breath you are after you do some exertional activity and you say, I'm an eight out of a 10, that really made me short of breath. That's what I need to record. It's not my, it's not my opinion, it's your perception, okay? So one of the best ways we do this in the clinic is we have a test called the Modified Medical Research Council, blah, blah, blah. It's a quick question, okay? So here it is. You guys are all taking this right now. So every, for the next four of these, we're gonna have you guys take this. So where are you on this scale? And at every clinic visit, I hope that we're asking you, where are you on this scale? Because that helps us follow your care. All right, does everybody have their answer, just so you know? So dyspnea, shortness of breath, is a very vague symptom, and it can be prescribed to a lot of different problems. So one of our, one of our things that's tasked to us is to make sure, is this patient's dyspnea, or maybe the worsening of dyspnea, related to 
the lung disease? Or could it be related to a variety of other things? Is this new onset heart failure? Is this anemia? Is this another problem like asthma? So I'll give an example right quick of a patient who was in a clinical trial. She was in the capacity study um, years ago. And the only reason she came in to see us in the clinic was to get a blood draw for her research study. So I go grab her, come on in back here and let me draw your blood. And she's walking a little slower and I'm like, Miss so-and-so, what, what's going on? And she's like, oh, I am so much short of breath today. And I said, uh, where was my phone call? Why didn't you call me? And she said, Wendy, there's nothing you can do about it. It's my, it's my IPF. So she had already decided that her shortness of breath was caused by her IPF. And I had already decided that I need to do a better job of teaching patients they need to call me when they have a symptom or a worsening of their symptom because it could have been anything else. So I sat her down and instead of just doing the blood draw that she should have had done and then saying goodbye, go tell somebody else about your shortness of breath, we decided to do a little bit of an assessment. And as soon as I put my fingers on her wrist to check her pulse, her heart rate was just everywhere. It was bouncing all over the place. I said, Miss, Miss Sonso, do you not feel your heart jumping around in your chest? She's like, no, I just feel short of breath. I said, so when did this start? And she said, well, I think it was yesterday at 2 o'clock. <laughs> but she attributed it to her IPF. I said, guess what? You just bought, you just bought an EKG. <laughs> Have a seat on the table. So we put her on the table, and sure enough, she had flipped into an atrial fibrillation. She had a rapid ventricular rate atrial fibrillation. She also bought a ticket into the hospital and we converted her and got her back into her normal sinus rhythm. If she hadn't have been in a clinical trial, she would have stayed at home with what she thought was worsening shortness of breath, could have very well had a stroke or died because of complications associated with rapid ventricular rate atrial fibrillation, all right? Anytime you have a change in your dyspnea, never automatically assume that it's related to your lung disease, okay? Next thing, hypoxemia. How is that different? Does anybody know what the difference is between dyspnea or shortness of breath and hypoxemia? Hypoxemia, how many of you have your pulse oximeters? Hypoxemia is when your oxygen saturation falls below 89%. So hypoxemia is different. How do we test that in the clinic? The best way is to do one of those needles into your artery and check your arterial saturation of oxygen, okay? That hurts, and I don't necessarily need to do that. When I got a thing, I can put on your finger and get the same, sort of the same answer. All right, so that's how we test for things. And of course, just like with dyspnea, as that gets worse, you, we, uh, we imagine your lung disease is getting worse. As hypoxemia gets worse, your lung disease gets worse. And as these both things get worse, your quality of life gets worse. So here's one of those handy dandy little ideas. When your oxygenation is below 89% or at 88 or lower, then concern rises. Our goal is to keep your oxygen saturations as best as we can, even with adding supplemental oxygen in the 90 percentile or better, all right? Remember, just like I said with shortness of breath, hypoxemia can be caused by a variety of other things. I brought my computer up here so I could take notes and wouldn't you know it just fell asleep. So um, lots of other problems can be caused by hypoxemia, like a blood clot in your lungs. So again, if you have problems with you know, your, your shortness of breath getting worse and your oxygen saturations getting lower, never assume this is my IPF getting worse, um, nothing they can do about it, because maybe there is something else going on and we can do something about that. Cough. Lots of coughers out there right now. So that's another thing that tends to get worse with disease progression. And you know, it's interesting to me that some people struggle with cough and some people don't. Some people are very fortunate that they don't struggle with cough. One of the best ways we measure this in the clinic is with a simple visual analog scale. So we might have a line on a piece of paper. It's about 100 millimeters long. And you basically mark where you're at that particular day related to your cough, 
all right? And as we do that over, you know, every time we see you in the clinic, that helps us judge, is your cough about the same? Is what we're doing helping your cough? Um, is your cough getting worse? Um, a lot of times, as you well know, as your cough gets worse, you tend to back out of different things that you want to be a part of. And my patients have told me I've stopped attending the symphony in Nashville because I worry about uh, you know, disturbing other people because of my cough. People back out of attending movies um, and doing things like that, going to see plays. Um, so we very much want a way that we can control cough. Reduced exercise capacity. As your disease progresses, this also gets worse. Um, so how do we best measure exercise capacity in the clinic? We do a walk study. So everybody get up. We're going to go outside and do a walk. No, I'm just kidding. So um, six-minute walk is one of the best ways that we can measure how well your exercise capacity is doing. And then again, comparing that visit to visit. Um, the six-minute walk test, I've heard patients call it the six-minute mile. Um, a lot of times we attribute um, reduced exercise capacity or maybe something called exercise intolerance to heart failure. Um, and when that happens in heart failure, it's really a management of the heart. The heart is not, when you're exercising, your muscles are working hard, your heart isn't able to get enough blood to your muscles. It's really a pumping action of the heart. But in this disease, you're usually, when you have a healthy heart, you're, you're getting blood to your muscles. The problem that you guys are having is it's not as oxygenated, so your lungs are absorbing all of that oxygen and, and leaving you in deficit. Um, and that's what's causing you to be um, exhibit reduced exercise capacity. So a lot of times people will complain that they're physically exhausted after they go about their routine, um, incredibly fatigued. I need you to report to your providers when that's happening. When you are so wiped out from an exercise routine that it takes you a day to recover, or when you have nausea or vomiting afterwards, those are a little different and those make us concerned that you could have some heart problems going on. So pay attention to things like muscle cramps um, or if you feel like your muscles are really heavy after activity. But that, that big key is, is fatigue. Are you having a lot of fatigue afterwards? Again, just like I've said about the last three, reduced exercise capacity could be a problem related to something else. So it's a matter of you telling your healthcare providers about these problems and letting us make sure that this isn't the manifestation of a, of a new heart failure. A couple other things that we don't do a good job in healthcare about, at least in, in our facets of healthcare, is making sure we're touching on depression and anxiety. And those are very much symptoms of these lung diseases. Um, depression caused by chronic illness is a real thing, and we need to do better as far as making sure that you're not depressed. So symptoms of depression, you know, everybody knows symptoms of depression are feeling sad or helpless or hopeless, but, but it is also being more irritable, um, less energetic, not having um, interest in activities or hobbies that you used to have interest in. It could manifest itself as aches or pains. So, you know, talking to your providers about these kind of things is very important. In the clinic, there are different things that we can do to kind of look and see what level of depression you may or may have and whether that level of depression requires further intervention, like seeing a counselor um, or going on some medicines. So again, talk to, talk to your providers about this and anxiety. Anxiety is a real deal, of course, especially when you're on oxygen. How are you coping with dealing with the fact with carrying, you know, e-cylinders around and how much time do I have before I have to get back to the house and, and are they ever going to get here with my equipment? I mean, so there's so many different things that go on with anxiety. But other, you know, symptoms of anxiety include headaches, muscle tension, gut complaints, um, feeling tired, having difficulty falling asleep. So these are kind of things that you need to talk with your healthcare providers about if you're experiencing things. And again, there are tools that we can use in the clinic setting to help us 
kind of manage that and make decisions on do you need therapies or not. So we take your symptoms and we kind of put them all together and we have to make sure, like I said, that your dyspnea is really caused by your lung disease or is it caused by something else. So we start putting the puzzle together. And we take, you know, if you come into clinic and you talk about being more short of breath, then there's going to be tests that we're going to do. And if things match up, that'll help us understand if your shortness of breath is being caused by your lung disease or if it be, could be caused by something else. So in this example, you know, if you come in and you say, I'm having a lot more short of breath and my, my oxygen numbers are bad, well, we're going to do a set of spirometry. And if your spirometry numbers are lower, then it makes sense that you'd be more short of breath. But if I do an EKG on you and I see some concerning changes related to a heart attack or a pending heart attack, then your shortness of breath and possibly your hypoxic state is going to alert me to maybe we need to get you over to cardiology or up to the emergency room. So again, speak to your doctors. They're going to be doing tests related to your dyspnea, to hypoxia, and maybe even some blood tests to um, let us know further what could be going on. Um, a blood test called a BNP is something we look to see if your dyspnea could be caused by your lungs or by your heart. A very elevated BNP will kind of lead us to believe that this could be um, some heart disease going on or, or poor heart pumping ability. So general management of symptoms. If there's anybody in this room that is smoking or vaping or using any kind of tobacco problem, you got to put it down, all right? Talk to your providers about putting it down. I mean, that's number one on my list for a reason. Um, remove the problem that's in your home. If, if something in your home or in your workplace is contributing to your shortness of breath, you got to get it out of there, which means birds. You know, a lot of times we are very attached to the birds in our home. They have to, they have to find a new place. Learn some re relaxation techniques or see a, see a psychologist and talk with them about different things. Um, distract yourself. That's, an, that's another good tool that you can use to manage your shortness of breath. When you start you know, feeling short of breath or feeling anxious, get up and do something different. Make your mind think about something else. Other ways to generally manage your symptoms are to maintain an ideal body weight. We've heard about people blowing fans on their faces. That's another way to manage dyspnea. Make some modifications in your home to make it easier to move around in your home, especially the bathroom. Um, do things that will help you get in and out of the shower, up and down, off of the john. And there's medicines. I only have one slide here for medicines because to me, medicines are, are down here on the list of what we're going to use to manage your symptoms. There are medicines for anxiety and depression there, and at late stage for dyspnea. Um, there are medicines for cough and every center in the United States kind of has a little list they go through to try and help um, manage cough. Unfortunately, cough is one of those things that's unmanageable and I believe I have a slide Yes, this one, um, whoops, this one is from a paper published by Susan Jacobs um, from you all's report of how we go about managing cough. And you, you don't see medicine on here. You see ginger tea. You see using honey, sips of water, ice chips, and things like that. In this survey, 29% of patients said absolutely nothing helps. So try these things and, and you'll be surprised. Incorporate your spouse or whoever lives in, in the home with you to ha have them help you learn if any of these things are helping your cough. I had a set of patients once and I, I used to tease them all the time. They had um, one eye between the two of them. All right, so she was completely blind, and he only had one eye that, that worked. So they had one eye between the two of them. And he was on a medicine in a clinical trial to help cough. And he came into his, one of his follow-up visits, and he said, I don't think that this medicine's helping me at all. And she immediately piped up, and she said, yes, it is. I don't have any idea where you are in the house anymore. <laughs> so um, you know, use that as a strategy tool. Use your spouse. 
So oxygen, lots of oxygen use in here. We use oxygen in the management of hypoxemia as well as dyspnea, um, as well as reduced exertional capacity and as a tool for depression, believe it or not. There have been some studies that show that the use of oxygen helps with depression. 30% um, of patients experience oxygen desaturation as they sleep. So another important thing to do is look and see if you may have a problem with sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, and get that evaluated. Um, oxygen is cumbersome. It's heavy. I love it when I have to, I have to, when I write a prescription for oxygen, I always write lightweight and portable oxygen tanks. There is no such thing. Um, you all know that. But, you know, it is what it is, it is and it, it's what we have right now. I always throw a caution out there about the portable oxygen concentrators. I think there's a lot of companies out there that do this to all of you. Okay. Look at our pretty little oxygen concentrator. It's this big, and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna work well for you. That might be good for the COPD group of patients, but most of the time it's not good for a pulmonary fibrosis group of patients. It might help you for about this much time. It's certainly not gonna help you for this much a time. So take good consideration. Talk to your healthcare providers before you go and purchase a POC. Remember, they're fishing for you. Pulmonary rehab, every single person in this room who has a diagnosis of fibrotic lung disease needs to have been or is going or will go to pulmonary rehab. It's incredibly um, useful and there's been a lot, of, a lot of papers published about the benefits of pulmonary rehab. One of the most important benefits is how it helps anxiety and depression. So even when you think you don't have problems with anxiety and depression, pulmonary rehab can help this. Um, all, nearly all the studies show about how pulmonary rehab can improve dyspnea and improve quality of life. It builds endurance. It helps you lose weight. It strengthens your muscles. It desensitizes you to being short of breath. I mean, it's list after list after list. Is it going to do anything for your lung disease itself? No. All right. But you can be a part of that, and, and despite this, pulmonary rehab helps everything around those lungs if it doesn't help those lungs. So be a part of pulmonary rehab. Don't stop exercising. Don't be afraid to exercise. But put things in your exercise routine that allows you to exercise. Listen to your body. If you get short of breath and your oxygen sets are dropping and you're wearing your oxygen like you're supposed to, you go ahead and you want to walk that mile. Maybe you need to walk a third of a mile, allow your body to rest, and get right back up on that treadmill and walk the next third. All right? Don't stop exercising, but be smart and listen to your body. I didn't let you guys see all these great pictures. I mean, there are... are, there are I see so many f great pictures of people pulling oxygen and exercising. People on the golf course. I had a patient once that we, um, he came into clinic and he was, he was pretty down one day. And, you know, I was, what's going on with you? And he's like, well, I haven't been able to golf in a while. My oxygen liter flows up to 10 liters. And all my golfing buddies say that uh, it takes me too long to get up on the tee box. And it got me so mad and fired up. I, I, I said, well, you need new friends. So I happened to, I looked him up to see where he lived in relation to me, because I was trying to learn how to golf, and I figured I, I better make good use of my time here. So I said, why don't you come teach me how to golf? Let's go play golf together, and we're going to figure out your oxygen thing. And we did. And that man lived another 18 months going out on the golf course two or three times a month hauling 10 liters of oxygen with him. And you know, that, that really, I, I wish I could put his picture up here of him swinging a golf club with his um, oxygen tank in the sand trap. <laughs> I bet he's giggling right now. I mean, I wasn't in that sand trap. Palliative care, I've talked about already today. Um, there are, um, you know, and I don't, I don't want anybody to shy away from the words palliative care. I want you all to go home and realize this is, palliative care does not mean giving up. It does not mean hospice. It means relief of suffering. And from the point of diagnosis, that's what we are doing without saying it.
Other words for palliative care might be supportive care or um, quality of life improvement care, things like that. If that's the way you need to think about it, think about it like that. But if I want to introduce palliative care to you, I've got a whole team of people that can help with relieving suffering. There was actually a study done um, by a group that, in, that did palliative care, with, or um, they did um, pulmonary rehab with a form in palliative care of, of counseling, um, cognitive behavioral feedback or something like this. And they showed that people actually had even a better performance in quality of life as well as reduction in depression and anxiety if they combined both of those techniques instead of just palliative care alone. So speaking of anxiety and depression, on your side of the table, these are, these are reasons why we don't talk about it, because you guys don't bring it up. You're, you're worried about it. You're embarrassed by it. You feel guilty. You're worried, oh my gosh, if I bring up anything about being depressed, they're just going to throw pills at me, and I don't want to be on any more pills, right? Those are true fears that you have. Um, maybe you don't recognize the symptoms, like I said. Um, recognize some of these symptoms that I mentioned earlier as possible symptoms of depression or anxiety and talk about them. And it's also on our side. You know, we don't talk about it. We don't bring it up. We don't question you about possible side effects or symptoms of depression or anxiety because who's got time? right? That's one of the things that we struggle with. We want to spend more and more time with you, but less and less time seems to happen. And I think, you know, sometimes we think, oh man, we're going to really open a can if we say, tell me, tell me about your day. Tell me what makes you happy. Tell me what kind of goals you have that you want to meet. But those are, those are discussions that need to happen, and I need to know why you're backing out of things. You know, if you're not doing things that you want to do, I need to know about it. Because if this is a symptom of depression, there's ways we can manage that. So it's not just patients not talking about it. It's healthcare providers not talking about it either. So I threw this up here because I knew the question was going to come. All right? I hear it all the time in the clinics. So we're all hearing it. And I will step and say I am not a person who knows really much about legalization of this or that, um, and I don't know much about the truth. I just will tell you this. So cannabidiol, if I'm saying that right, you know, CBD oil, CBD gummies, CBD everything, there is nothing proven that that will help you. Nothing. Okay? Nothing. When you go on the website and you search, is CBD oil going to help my dyspnea? what you'll find is a bunch of advertisements saying, oh yeah, it may help your dyspnea. It may help. There is nothing proven, all right? Well, does it? Maybe it does. And if it does, or if your perception of dyspnea is that your dyspnea is improved, good. Tell your healthcare provider you're taking it. Nobody's gonna look down their nose on you or anything. If you feel like you're improving, you're improving, good. But don't let somebody sell you a product, okay? Do you hear what I'm saying? Don't let anybody tap into your fears and sell you something, okay? Um, THC is the other side of that plant, and that's the, plant, that's the side of the plant that contributes to the high that people feel, but CBD, it is being studied, and there is a medicine that the FDA approved last year, but it's not for dyspnea, it's not for pain, it's not for any of these other things that they try and push onto our patients. It's for epilepsy, severe forms of epilepsy. All right, so studies are being done. A lot of those studies are being done in animals, and there are studies that are creeping into the human population. So I think there's more to come on that, but I just want you to hear me. Don't let anybody guide you, okay? Don't let anybody take advantage of you. All right, so final slide. The key to all of this is talking, all right? I hope you heard that in the message. The key to all us being able to manage your symptoms together is you need to talk to us, all right? 
The la <laughs> I always get tickled when I talk to a patient and I say, how are you doing? How's your shortness of breath? And he says, oh, I'm good. And his wife's sitting over there, you know, because she's the one that's listening to, to what's going on at home. You know, the complaints that you're given at home, your struggles with your oxygen company, your struggles with breathing, the struggles you have with cough, those are the things you need to bring into the clinic and talk to your health care provider about. But I also want you to talk about new things. If you're having new joint pain in your hands, that could be a problem that, that maybe your lung disease is, is um, responsible for. Are you having dry eyes or dry mouth? Any changes in your cough? Like, you know, for the last three months, now I'm coughing up blood-streaked sputum or things like this. I need to know that, all right? Never feel that you're wasting or bothering somebody's time or taking advantage of time. That's our time. So any new changes, talk about it, all right? It's been my pleasure to, to be a part of um, this conference. and. Uh, that, oh, I thought I put my number up here. This is my phone number and my email address. If you all ever have any questions, remind me who you are, because I'm not gonna remember, but ask, all right? Ask your doctor, ask your nurses at your, um, at your care centers. Thank you very much.